Hello folks, welcome back to the channel. Thank you very much for joining me. You are always most welcome. Well, in one of my recent videos, uh, I think it was in one of the Matchbox March series, um, some one of you, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the gentleman's name, and he said, oh, I really enjoy your videos, which is <laughs> was nice to hear. But he, he, the way he put it, he said, it's almost like you pop in for a brew and a natter. So today, we're going to have a proper natter, and we're going to look at an aircraft called the Natter, which, by the way, is German for grass snake. Uh, I think it's like that version of Adder, basically. Now then, once again, a great friend of the channel has provided the material we're going to look at today, and it's our old friend Paul Hunter, um, who lives up in uh, North Yorkshire there in Harrogate, and he... Uh, has very kindly provided, well he's actually given me one of these kits, the, uh, the small natter which is in 70 second scale by Bren Gunn, which we're going to have a look at that. We're also going to look at the bigger one, 48 scale natter from Ravel and he's given me, he's done all the work for me, he's done all the research, I can just read it out. <laughs> I'll tell you the little bit that I do now. This is one of those German sort of vengeance weapons that was really intended as a, a last ditch defence of the Reich in 1944-45. Um, and there was um, there is actually a very good video by the way. I'll give, give somebody else a plug who deserves it here. Uh, Mark Felton, who does all this historic, um, especially World War Two sort of centric uh, stories, he's got a very good one about the Natter. Actually, I can I can recommend it to you. I'll put a link at the end uh, in the description. Um, so go and have a look at his uh, his video because it is quite astonishing. This one. Uh, I mean, we thought the me the me one two six two was a bit. Uh, ambitious. And then we saw the ME163B Comet, which people thought was a bit crazy because it was very dangerous. Well, this takes crazy and dangerous to a whole new level, doesn't it? So here we're actually launching an aircraft off a tower, like the Space Shuttle. It's rocket propelled, it's using a rocket motor the same basically as what's in the ME163, with four additional boosters. It flies off a tower, NASA fashion, and it, the idea is it's going to attack the American or British bomber streams. It's a daylight thing, so it's probably going to be the American B-17 bomber streams. Um, it's going to attack them. It's got this nose with all these multiple rocket launchers in it. It's going to blast them with the rockets. Then, having done its terrible damage and uh, you know, damaged the American bomber or shot it down, it's then going to... this is where it gets really weird. Okay, you, so you've already launched off a tower, that's pretty weird for the end of the war. Then he's going to fly down, detach the nose section, uh, bail out the pilot, uh, and come back to Earth on a parachute. And the rest of the aircraft will also uh, emit a parachute from the back and also float back to Earth. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen the actual official video, which is in Mark Felton's research in his video. And you, you just watch this and you think, no, I don't think, no, if I was a German pilot, then no, I think I'll just... You know, suddenly the ME262 sounds quite safe by comparison. <laughs> even the even the 163 does. This is absolute suicide. Anyway, I'm going to start off, before I get into the actual kit, I'm just going to start off by reading you some of the, the data that Paul's provided for us. Um, I think you'll find it very interesting, and he's done some really good work here. So let me just read this to you. Uh, so I so say we've got the two kits. We've got the Bren Gun, the smaller one, and we've got the Revel 1, 148. And he says, the Revel 148 features... The Natter Operational Launch Tower. The operational tower differed from the test tower as the test tower was bigger and had vertical guide rails that extended to the tip wingtips of the Natter. Okay. Um, the operational tower here was smaller and had vertical guide rails that were inboard of the Natter's wings. Yes, you can see that here. Okay. Interesting. Two. Any representation of the Natter adorned with swastikas or Luftwaffe insignia are incorrect. In accordance with the Air Ministry regulations, no insignia would have been allowed because the Natter was an ex was was an expendable vehicle. Hmm, okay. Well, I know that they were trying to recover bits here, probably because they were short of cash and didn't have any materials to build anymore. But anyway, three. The Natter was proven to be stable across all flight modes. Manned. Sorry. Manned horizontal glide tests of the Natter were successful. However, the unmanned vertical launches were not completely successful, but these failures were due to problems with the Natter's auxiliary systems and not due to any flight instability itself. Four. Eight volunteer pilots crazy, were expecting to fly three combat-ready Natters on the 20th of April 1945, which was Hitler's birthday, his last birthday. 
but on that day the US 10th Armoured Division drove its tanks into Kirchheim Uter Tech to the northwest of Hasenholz in Austria where they kept, were then captured by the Allies. Now there's a famous photograph I've actually seen um, now he's mentioned that, where you can see there's on the, I think it's the same airfield in Austria they've got ME262s and they've got these and you can see them all in different states of assembly and disrepair uh, so that would be the same airfield I think he says five Eric Bagcham the Natter's designer Backham, sorry, Backham Eric Backham, the Natter's designer in 1947-48 left Germany through Denmark and Sweden in order to settle in Argentina in Argentina, amongst other things, he constructed a factory for guitars with interchangeable bottoms. Okay. Wow. Now then, the Natter suffered several design flaws. <laughs> the whole concept looks flawed to me, but anyway. Let's, let's listen to Paul's uh, detail here. He says, During the first manned vertical launch test on the 1st of March, 45, it really came too late, this absolute, didn't it? The vehicle BA 349A M23 lost was lost, killing its test pilot, Lieutenant Lothar Sieber. At 1600 feet, it was observed that the canopy flew off and fell to the ground while the natter disappeared into the clouds. Examination of the canopy, which fell near the launch site, showed the tip of the latch was bent, suggesting it may not have been fully in the closed position at launch. Oh dear, that's a bit silly. The design of the canopy would appear to be flawed in another respect. The pilot's headrest was attached to the underside of the canopy. And as the canopy flew off the flew off the pilot's head. As sorry, as the canopy flew off, the pilot's head would have snapped back suddenly about 25 centimetres, nearly 10 inches, hitting the solid wooden rear upper cockpit bulkhead. And either knocking Sieber unconscious or breaking his neck. Oh crumbs. Furthermore, one of the four solid rocket fuel boosters failed to detach and was found in the NATO wreckage. Yeah, that really went wrong, didn't it? Seven. This is not related to the accident, but in my research I can't find any discussion regarding the NATO's changing centre of gravity. <laughs> OK, now this you can understand. Which may have forced it to go out of trim at some point during its mission. The change in the centre of gravity would have been caused by the Natter's armament, which was the 28 R4M rockets that are in the nose, or a number of the larger 73mm Henschel HS297 foam rockets. As these rockets were located in the nose, this would have adversely affected the trim, causing an extremely tail-heavy trim once all the rockets had been fired. This tail-heavy trim would have been a massive problem because after its attack, the Natter was still required to maintain a stable glide from about 25,000 feet to down to 3,000 feet, from which height the pilot would then bail out. Having said that, I don't think the Natter's design could have overlooked such an important and obvious aspect of its design. But the following is purely my speculation. So this is Paul Hunter's research. He says, Assume the Natter would be in trim at launch, having the weight of the four solid rocket boosters at the rear, offset by the weight of the rocket armament at the front. Okay. After jettisoning the four rocket boosters, the Natter would then be out of trim and incredibly nose heavy during its attack run. Probably, yeah, okay, you can see the logic in that though, it, it would probably work, wouldn't it? If all goes, you know, with a fair wind, as they say. And then finally, after firing the rockets, the uh, rocket arm, um, the Natter would then be back in trim and then, in theory, able to maintain a stable glide from 25,000 feet down to 3,000 feet. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. It's, it's, probably, it's all very theoretical, it's all based on everything going perfect, isn't it? It's a lot of risk, isn't there? There's a lot of risk in this. Anyway, without further ado, thank you, Paul. That is absolute gold. You've done all my homework for me. I could just sit back, really, and let you do it for me. <laughs> anyway, I hope you found that was uh, read correctly, etc. Let's have a look at the little one first, which he sent me as a gift, really, so thank you very much indeed. Look at this. Let's just move the, the big one out for a second, and let's get in and look at this most bizarre of weapons, frankly. So, this is Bren Gun. This is their 70 second scale, and you see it's attacking the uh, US bomber streams with B-17s here. And on the, oops, sorry, yeah. on the back we've got these sort of paint call-out, colour call-outs. Um, yeah, not a lot of English on here, but um, it's clear enough, isn't it? What a strange looking machine it really is. I have a feeling I've seen one of these. Um, Is there not one of these in the Imperial War Museum in London? I've got a feeling it's in the, in the 
they had one in the central atrium. Was it this or was it the salamander? No, I think it's the salamander, isn't it? Yeah, okay, ignore me, it's all right then. Just couldn't remember that. <laughs> I think it was one of their more extreme aeroplanes, anyway. So, let's just have a look. And I literally haven't opened this. This is the very first opening of this kit, so I've never seen it before. We are having a very first look. Oh, there's not, there's not a huge amount of it, okay. Because it's quite small, isn't it, I guess? Right, well, let's get straight into this then. Let's see what we have here. Okay. Oh, it holds a bit more than I thought. Plastic construction cut. Now I've never seen a Bren gun kit before. I have got one of their bits of um, PE. Um, I've actually got the Harrier uh, ladder for climbing into the Harrier, the one that's just behind my head in there, as you can see now, just behind me here in the image. Uh, it's for the 48 scale Harrier, it's just the uh, access ladder for the crew, for the pilot. And I've never seen one of their kits, so let's have, let's have a good look at this then, see what you think. So, yes, well there aren't many parts obviously, nice uh, bit of uh, artwork, and there's a little screw trim map here. Uh, looks fairly straightforward, it has to be said, so what have we got? So we start off with what looks like the front bulkheads, uh, and you're building these front bulkheads up, uh, and then putting in the cockpit area, uh, complete with seat, which looks, ooh, looks very rudimentary, that seat does, it looks like a bench, doesn't it? Really? This looks like a death trap to set this aircraft to me. <laughs> anyway, then you've got the uh, the nose going in with the uh, the rockets, uh, the rocket launching nose with this very blunt front it has. It doesn't look terribly aerodynamic, does it? This rocket frontage, you know. It's a pity they didn't have a detachable cone, really, isn't it, for lift off? But anyway, I'm just theorising. Then we've got the uh, the sort of rocket jet motor at the back where the Volta rocket motor goes. And then you're bringing in your fuselage. Uh, attaching all this to the fuselage and then bringing in the other half to make it a uh, complete uh, central fuselage. Then you've got your tail, this odd tail section. It's a quite simple design actually, isn't it? That's one part of it that doesn't look that advanced. Almost like a glider really. And then you've got these, um, these additional rocket boosters which are detachable and supposed to be ejected. And then you've got your little stubby wings. Little stubby wings that have got to go on here. And then last but not least, you are attaching your booster rockets on the side. You've got a nice little, uh, like a trestle stand that it stands on, which is very cool. That's good. Then you're bringing in your sort of rocket gun sight and your canopy, which has got this headrest attached to it, allegedly. I don't think it has in the kit, but apparently this is the danger that Paul Hunter has alluded to. Very dangerous indeed. And then, and then there we go. It's... Uh, it sits on this little trestle at the end. Looks looks a very cool kit. Let's look at the parts then. Let's bring you right in. So obviously this is Brengon. They're made in the Czech Republic. For those of you that don't have ever heard of them. Um, right, okay. It looks quite nice, doesn't it? A little, there's a little bit of flash here and there, but nothing major. Um, I like the way they've got this sort of wooden trestle style. That looks quite, quite realistic on the wood finish. And then we've got the little stubby wings, tail section, uh, and rudder I should say, and then you've got your major elevators there, and your little stubby tail, and then you've got your, your nose section. I've got to say it's not the, uh, the most uh, eloquently moulded, I'm not sure if it's picking up on the camera or not, it's not the finest moulding I've ever seen. Uh, I say I've never seen a brand gun one before, so uh, it's new to me. And then finally you've got your uh, little fuselage section down here at the bottom. There we go. Over here we've got a little uh, bag which has got in it the canopy. Yep, canopy. Not much of a canopy is it? It's very, uh, you need masking of course that because it's, there's, there's not that much glass area in trip. And then you've got a little tiny bit of photo edge which is very nice. Oops, there we go. And some decals. So it's quite a nice little package actually. Um, yeah, as I say it's a little bit flashy, and uh, it's perhaps not that not that detailed, uh, like the rockets at the front. I think that's a little bit softly moulded, but it's overall it's very nice, and it's all on one sprue. It reminds me actually of that um, the other review that I did, which was on the uh, 
the V, I think that was 70 second scale, and we did the the model collect, I think it was, V1 flying bomb, about eight months ago. If you go back in the uh, the collection on the channel, you'll see that review I did there. Um, but no, I like it, very nice indeed, thank you very much Paul. I'll probably build that because it's nice and small, so I can find a home for that in one of my cabinets. I'm sure it can sit next to the V1 flying bomb I've got without taking up too much space, which is one of my biggest problems these days. So there we are. Excellent. Very excellent. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, so in terms of marks out of 10, I'm not sound ungrateful, it's a gift, so ooh, careful what you say. <laughs> I'd say, sorry, I think probably 8 out of 10, uh, 8, eight, eight and a half, because it's, it's a nice little kit. Uh, just likes a little bit of finesse on the detailing on some of the um, the moulding on some of the parts, but but it'll look good when it's painted up. I'm sure I can get that looking very nice. Let's have a look at the big one then. So this is the Tam uh, Tamiya Revell. Uh, just got yeah, a bit something about the one Revell. What does it tell us on the side? Ah, yes, here we go. We've got. And by the way, this is um, this is Paul's kit. He, he wants this back for understandable reasons. So let me just zoom you in on this one and see what we've got. The lights are not blinding it. There we go. So you can see the detail on the nose, the rockets on the nose. You've got this uh, tower system which is going to launch up like the space shuttle. Uh, and then you've got these uh, booster rockets at the back. And then you can see it there. It's, it's in like a sling. Uh, it's a very curious setup, isn't it? It's, it's like it's like got these braces over its wings to launch it. How odd. It's interesting. Let's have a look inside, see what we have. Okay, ah, now, slight problem, I think, it's the bag open? Yes, we have it in a bag. We have it in a bag, now, does Paul want me to open the bag? I'm not, I'm not too sure. I think, I think he does, because he wanted me to review it. He wanted me to review this, and as it's not, you know, Revell or, you know, Wing Not Wings, I think, I hope I'm doing the right thing here. Mm -hmm. I might have just bought it without <laughs> realising. But I think he wants me to open it because he did say have a good look at it and do a review, you know. So I think we'll be alright if I'm very careful in the way I open them and then seal them up again. I think he wants to build it at some point. Let's have a look at the instructions which are not Revell's strong point. What was the year on this? Did we check that? Have we got a year anywhere, folks? Give us a year, give us a year. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Sometimes they just don't say, do they? Revel. I probably should have checked scale mates first just to double check it. Does it say on here? Printed in Germany 2000. Yes, okay. So it's fairly recent. Probably two years. <laughs> the reason I mention it though, it's not their best instruction, it's not their finest hour instruction. Let's have a zoom in on this. You've got spoo trees here on the left, as you can see. Um, not that many of them, I don't think. I think most of it's the tower, really, because it's quite complicated. Start here by... Uh, it's, not, it's not the greatest, most photogenic colour on this. For, I'm not sure if it's coming out on the, the video well, but let's hope it does. But we've got um, the building of the, the cockpit area with this very strange seat, which again looks like a bench. It looks like a garden bench, almost. It's most peculiar, with the seating arrangement. Whether that's because you need to get out quick, which you certainly do. <laughs> uh, and then you're building up your nose, a bit like the other kit. You're building up this uh, nose section internally for the rocket, uh, the rocket pod as it were, which does detach on the actual aircraft, it detaches. Um, there's actually a graphic that the Germans produced, like an animation of it detaching and then the pilot jumping out triggering his parachute and the parachute of the main aircraft also triggering so it's quite a complicated setup. Now here you get an image that shows ah what did I say? I said I said isn't it surprising it doesn't have a trim fairing nose cap? Well it does. I think it's optional. So they obviously did, did have those as well. Makes sense I think. So that you know once they're in flight and they're approaching the bombers he probably flicks a switch and the cap drops away and then he's exposing his rockets. Now here you can see, it's not a very big picture image, but you can see it on its tower. That's quite cool. And then here we've got um, the, the Volta rocket motor at the back end. You're building up your tail section and rudders. 
uh, with your elevators and then you bring in all these stubby little bits. It's quite unitary so you've got the back section and the front section now coming all in together and popping on your wings here. And then you've got your Valter rocket motor you're going to build up. Sorry, not the Valter rocket motor, it's the, uh, the booster motors I should say. Booster rockets on the back, building those in and attaching them thus. And then you've got your instruments on the inside of the front of the canopy it seems. And then you've got to uh, prepare the latches that are on the canopy, detachable canopy. Um, which is this thing where it's attaching to the headrest and it's a bit dangerous isn't it? So if that comes undone, which is what Paul thinks happened from his research. Very nasty accident, obviously broke his neck or did him an injury, on, at least knocked him unconscious. So. Nasty, very nasty. Um, so that goes in there, and then you're going to build this uh, very complex sort of uh, rocket tower. It's all very NASA, isn't it? Very space shuttle-like almost. So you've got this um, sort of central rail. Uh, it's like a pole, really, up the middle, and then you've got these sort of support rails that the wings effectively run on, um, and it sort of has like what looks like a tensioning system. So it gets a bit complicated. Very complicated, actually. Um, and you've got these um, like little uh, stanchions, as it were, these little supports all the way down. And you're gonna—it's it's quite intricate. There's quite a lot of work here. You're gonna glue those all in, and then you're gonna attach your rails. And it looks like it has a sort of a swinging arm at the bottom and a base section here. And then it has this strange. Uh, I called it braces, didn't I? I mean, it's like um, it's like a cradle, really, that it sort of holds the wings by and launch. And then once it gets to the top, it must release them, I guess, and everything flies off. Quite a very complicated idea, isn't it? It's I don't know. I'm not trying to be negative about the concept, but it does seem doomed to fail somehow, doesn't it? It's so complicated, you know. I mean, this looks like the space shuttle in miniature, really. You've got a big ladder there as well, look. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And then you've got this um, used thread as the tensioning, uh, sort of like a bungee almost. I mean, it's like a it's like a catapult, basically. That's what it is. It actually says, it actually says catapult. Oh my goodness! Wow, that is just incredible. So it's basically almost a bungee, fly, flying a jet fighter with rockets on a bungee, effectively. What a strange machine! But you know, it's quite. Obviously took, took it seriously enough to build it, but I think yet, yet again more resources were being diverted where they should have just bought lots of fucker Wolf 90s really, but anyway. Um, perhaps not, because they were getting a bit outclassed, weren't they, I suppose. Uh, for me, they should have put all their efforts into the ME262, because that was the standout aircraft, and developments of that would have made a lot more sense. Anyway, here you've got these different versions. There's no Nazi markings on this one. Not through political correctness, but because it didn't actually have them. It was an experimental and disposable aircraft, potentially, so they didn't bother. Um, there are little markings on it at all here, just the number two. Uh, and just one or two little bits of wiring. And, uh, there's a couple of... Uh, yeah, there's some stencils here, of course, which I didn't mention. And there we have it. So, <clears throat> it certainly is a very, very interesting concept, I have to say. So, uh, if this is okay, Paul, I'm going to open the bag very carefully and then I'll seal them back up. Um, and we shall have a look. Try and do this very, very gingerly try and minimise bag damage, he says. <laughs> no, okay. no problem, just the outer bag. And then, yeah, this is going to be really interesting. I think we've got a lot more detail on this version than we have on the other smaller one. That's, oh, we've got one open, that's good, the bag's already open. I don't have to feel guilty on this one. <laughs> Let's just zoom you in. There we go. Now then, clear parts. So it's actually the nose. So was the nose actually clear? Is that right? Uh, maybe it was deliberately so that they could see that it had the the, the rockets were armed and, and in the tubes, you know. So I guess that's uh, that's the way they've gone uh, for visibility. But it's nice, isn't it? Quite nice clear parts actually. Obviously, a bit of masking needed because 
there's not a huge amount, as we said, there's not a huge amount of glass area, especially at the sides. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a nice sprue, that. Oops. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, nice clear parts, I think. Very, very good. Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Super duper. That's great. This first one done. Um, I won't open this one. I won't open this one because there's only um, quite a few, very few parts in here. Um, but it's some little, uh, I think it's to do with the tower, it's some of these little, uh, yeah, part of it's to do with the, the, the gun sight, I think, on the front as well, of the nose. That's all included. It looks quite nicely moulded, there's no flash. Now then, uh, I think I'll minimise opening some of the bags. Some I will open, some I won't open. So, this is all the tower. I think I probably will turn this because there's two that are identical anyway. Let's just zoom you out a little bit because it is big. So this is this base. This is absolutely huge. It interlocks. It's quite a big chunk of plastic. Look at the size of that compared to my hands. So it's just two, it's just quite a smooth base and it kind of interlocks. And then you've got the parts that form the tower complete with its sort of pylons which all attach together to, to make the rail supports basically. So that's quite good, but I don't think we really need to have that. That's critical. This one we will open. This has got a bit more detail in it. Um, now this is the central part of the tower, this great big, almost like a telegraph pole it looks like, which is the central big meaty support that, on which the whole thing is assembled. <clears throat> it's quite big, you know, and you assemble, there's two, two sections, two halves here, two halves here. When you connect them together, that's well over a foot long, isn't it? It's going to be, you know, this big. Yeah, it's going to be, um, yeah, tw I say it's going to be twice the width of this sprue, it'll be like that, from the end of the sprue to, the, to my hand. Quite a big old tower, isn't it? You've got this lovely uh, ladder they've done. I've got to say the moulding on this, I'm suspicious this is not necessarily originally moulded by Ravel. I don't want to sound harsh. I'm sure if I go to scale mates I might well find this has been done by somebody else because it just looks too good. And it reminds me of the V2. It says Ravel on the actual sprue though. Could be wrong. If it is, it's one of their better kits because it looks really nice. There's no flash. Sometimes their kits can be absolutely appalling to be quite honest. So it just cheeses me off. But this isn't one of them. This is really good. This is really good. Look at all these rails look for the actual tower and the support pylons fantastic absolutely brilliant love it love it love it um, they even include a bag with thread in it that's the thread that you're gonna have as the bungee <laughs> it's like bungee jumping on a you know you could say that it uh, it takes the dangers of bungee jumping to a whole new level this does <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? Suicide mission, really. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing for the pilots, really, that he didn't, that, you know, a couple of days later the war was over and after doing these test flights, weren't they? Wow, another nice sprue, look at this. So this is the main sprue now with all the, the detail on it, including the um, fuselage and the nose section. Now look at this nose where the rockets protrude. Well, they're not true, but they're visible, I should say. That is really, really detailed. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Wow. Love it. This is a nice kit. I say, it makes me doubtful it's Ravel in the first instance, but, you know. We should look it up. Maybe just have a check on scale, mates, because I'm just not convinced. It seems too good. <laughs> There's another nose here. Now, that's interesting. There's another nose section. So maybe that clear one that we, sh we saw... Maybe that is just for show, because that seems to be exactly the same as it was on the clear section. Yeah, I'm sure it's the same shape. Put them side by side, you see that? Pop it out again. A second. There we go. Side by side, two nose sections. Yeah, it's the same. It's just one's clear and one isn't. Um, you've got the rocket motors here. Greatly detailed this time. Yeah, very, very well moulded. You've got your instruments here, which do remind me of the ME163 instrumentation. Awfully similar there. Yeah. 
and then you've got various small parts. You've got your your tail section here with the rudder on it there, and then you've got your elevators there. That is really nice, I've got to say. Um, I was a little bit worried when Paul sent this through and I thought, oh Revel, oh here we go again, but no, it's actually really nice. It's a really nice kit. I, I'm going to give this, ooh, I might surprise you. I'm going to give it 9 out of 10. The, the instructions aren't very good, uh, but they never are on that, that era of Revel, to be fair. But the actual moulding is really nice. There's no flash. All looks really well figured, very finely done. The, the nose, on this it's the nose with the rockets, that's the real deal breaker if you like. That's the thing that really tells you how well they've moulded it and that is just stunning. You can actually see the rockets in the nose. They've done it beautifully. 9 out of 10. Hope you'll give me 10 out of 10 with a thumbs up. And don't forget if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, uh, thank, you know, basically click on the subscribe button. And if you have done, don't forget to ding the notification bell and smash that like button <laughs> so that I get as much support as possible. Thank you very much to uh, Paul Hunter for providing these kits. Uh, really nice to see something unusual as well. I'll put a link, as I say, to the Mark Felton video where he goes into the details, which will amaze you when you watch this. You're thinking, what were they thinking of? You know, it's a very, very uh, alternative, oddball solution to a problem. Um, not the safest, frankly, uh, at a time when a lot of these devices that were being developed by the Nazis were all crazy, you know, the end of the war. But anyway, thanks very much for joining me. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, really enjoyed your company. Thank you for taking the time. And until the next video, please look after yourselves. Stay safe, stay well. Thanks very much for joining me. And bye for now.